Cooperstown, New York, the birthplace of our national sport. From a back pasture game first played here on Doubleday Field, baseball has grown into one of the greatest team sports in the world. It has marched side by side with the development of a great nation. Today, baseball men from all over the country have gathered here to do honor to the members of the Hall of Fame who have built a monument of their own, a monument of integrity, which has been the very foundation of baseball. This is baseball's National Museum, where the gloves, bats, uniforms, and other treasured trophies of famous players will be preserved along with their records. The picturesque village of Cooperstown stands by to hear the words of the immortals of baseball. The High Commissioner of Baseball, Judge Landis, makes the dedication. To the 13 pioneers who were the moving spirits of the game in its infancy, and to the 12 players who've been nominated to the Hall of Fame by the Baseball Writers Association. We pay tribute, just tribute. But I should like, and I think all these immortals of baseball would agree with me, to dedicate this museum to all America, to lovers of good sportsmanship, healthy bodies, keen minds, or those are the principles of baseball. <laughs> Genial Connie Mack, manager of the Philadelphia Athletics. I feel greatly honored in being here today with the other great stars of baseball and with all of those who have taken part in promoting the interest of baseball. And I am quite positive that in the years to come that uh, we can look forward to our game still progressing. Due to the and here's the great Ty Cobb. Well, this is a great day in my life. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I feel greatly honored, uh, the privilege of being here. A Bambino himself, Babe Ruth. Some been here long before my time. They got on it, and I worked hard, and I got on it. And I hope that the coming generation, the young boys today, that they'll work hard and also be on it. And as my old friend Cy Young says, I hope it goes another 100 years, and the next 100 years will be the greatest. You know, to me, this is just like an anniversary myself. Because 25 years ago yesterday, I pitched my first baseball game in Boston for the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> so it seems like an anniversary for me, too, and I'm surely glad. And it's a pleasure for me to come up here and be picked also on the Hall of Fame. Thank you. Eddie Collins, a member of the Hall of Fame, chats with Charlie Garinger of Detroit Tigers. Charlie, I only hope that you can look forward to this day when you're going to be up here in the same capacity that I've had the good fortune to be in today. I know there's no one more deserving than you, and I'm sure your time is coming. And I hope you'll get as big a kick out of it as I've got out of it today. Good well, thank, luck to you. Thank you, Eddie. I know you're deserving of it. I hope I only don't have to wait another hundred years. Walter Johnson, George Sisler, Christy Matthewson, Honus Wagner. Truly great names to head this scroll of honor, soon to be joined by the great players of today. Some of them will come from these American League clubs. Fenway Park, the Boston Red Sox, where Babe Ruth first became famous. Cleveland Stadium, home of the Indians, who have many promising young players. Griffith Stadium, a Washington Nationals on the lookout for another Walter Johnson. Sportsman's Park, home of the St. Louis Browns, who have already sent George Sister. Comiskey Park, Chicago White Sox, a team that has developed many great players. Chibe Park, Philadelphia Athletics. Manager Connie Mack has shown his players the way to the Hall of Fame. Briggs Stadium, Detroit. Ty Cobb led the way for the Tigers. Who will be next? Yankee Stadium, home of the world's champions. That speaks for itself. But there are still other fields outside of these clubs where new stars are in the making. Here's another source of names for baseball's Hall of Fame. 
This year, 500,000 American Legion junior baseball players are striving for these same honors. Some of the members of the American Legion Post 209, Akron, Ohio. Commander, William Harridge, president of the American League and our club owners, have sent me over here to Akron, Ohio to witness your American League junior baseball festivities. And I'm sent here with a message from all of them that we are behind the American Legion baseball plan 100%. We are proud to state that more than 25 boys, graduates of the American Legion, baseball, are now playing in the major leagues. The Legion adopts the model. It pays to play. Commander, uh, the only thing I can say in conclusion here is that we all hope that many more of these boys, such as are playing out here today in this diamond, will wend their way through the channels of professional baseball up into the major league. Boys, we hope a lot of you make the grade. With organizations like Legion Baseball, every boy has an opportunity to make good. In Cleveland, another friend of the youngsters, the Cleveland Amateur Baseball Federation. There are two of our hometown boys who are among the 11, the only 11 immortals of baseball, who have done a great good for us insofar as providing our funds are concerned from year to year. Those two are none other than Chris Speaker and Larry Madgeway. And on behalf of the Cleveland Baseball Federation, I want to present a little token with this inscription, both reading the same, presented to Tris Speaker of Baseball's Hall of Fame in appreciation of the examples you have left the Sandlot Kitties during the pioneer days when you were helping to make baseball our national pastime. To them, you are both teacher and hero. Here you are, Tris, and here you are, Larry. Well, Larry, you know this has been a great day for us, or at least uh, it has for me, and I know that you've appreciated being down here for these boys. This hospitalization fund has been a great thing. I've had a great, lot, a great deal of pleasure in working with the, the committee of the Cleveland Federation of Baseball, and I do appreciate this great visit. Father Flanagan, Boys Town Band from the famous Boys Town, Nebraska, escorting their team here for Amateur Baseball Day. They are here to play a picked team from Parmadale. And here's the friend of every boy, Father Flanagan. We are here to celebrate with Cleveland, Sam Lott, 100th Anniversary Baseball. Naturally, we have always been baseball-minded and football-minded at Boys Town. With this thought in mind, I recommend to American fathers and mothers that they should raise their voices in endeavoring to secure for our American children greater facilities for playing sandbox spot baseball because it pays to play. The crack of the bat, another strikeout, sensational stops, the slide for the base, thrills galore. That's baseball, a game that calls for physical courage, good health, and clean fun. Baseball is one game that is fun to practice. By playing the game, these boys develop a quality of sportsmanship and courage that will play an important part of their life. With eyes like a giant periscope, the motion picture camera now takes you around the big league diamonds for the highlights of the season, with the compliments of the Kellogg Company of Battle Creek, Michigan, and the American League of Professional Baseball Clubs. In the American League each year, a new crop of freshman stars appear. Just another sound reason why the game of baseball will go on, as brilliant youngsters replace those who already have made a name for themselves and the game. Here we present some of the new finds of the league who will set new pitching, batting, and fielding records for future youngsters to shoot at. Charlie Keller, World Series hero, and Atlee Donald, who set a new league freshman pitching record. Ted Williams, who packs a Babe Ruth wallop in that bat of his with Jimmy Tabor, who played a bang-up game around the hot corner, third base to you. Bonnie McCroskey and Benny McCoy, two up-and-coming youngsters of the Detroit Tigers, who appear headed for stardom. Jack Kramer, youthful right-hand pitcher for the St. Louis Browns. Lou Bedreau and Ray Mack, a new double-play combination of the Cleveland Indians. Bedreau is a former player and student of the University of Illinois. Many former college players are making good in the league. 
And from the looks of things, these two newcomers know their way around the diamond. What some of these rookies have already accomplished should encourage every young ball player. And speaking of fast action around the Keystone sack, introducing the clever double play combination of the New York Yankees, Frank Prosetti and Joe Flash Gordon. All right, boys, tell us about a few important plays around second base. The second baseman and shortstop, much like the pitcher and catcher, must team together more often than any other players on the diamond. That's why Joe and I try to have an understanding where each of us will be in case the play comes up around a keystone sack. Uh, first, we give the signal who is to cover the bag on attempted steal. Then we move in a couple steps when the double play is in sight. Watch us go through some of these plays. Uh, learn to play the ball. Don't allow the ball to play you. That's right, Frank. One thing all infielders should remember and practice, learn to play the ball. Don't allow the ball to play you. When coming in to field a ground ball, the shortstop should practice throwing slow hits in one motion, having a good throwing arm, and to be able to throw accurately with either underhand, sidearm, or overhand is necessary. In this play, the infielder keeps his glove as close to the ground as possible, his eye following the ball until it has settled in its glove. The slow motion camera analyzes the finished style of Joe Gordon. Coming in to play the ball, he never lifts his head, as the last bounce of the ball might be a bad hop. Hands close to the ground, eyes on the ball. In this manner, his hands and arms can come up from such a position much more quickly than they could be thrust downward on a bad bounce or a scooting grounder. Brace yourself on your right foot before making the throw. When you feel the ground ball, any great distance to your right. Here's one of the most difficult of all plays at shortstop. When the ball is hit between short and third in this manner, the shortstop breaks fast to his right from his starting position in order to reach the ball. As the ball settles in his glove, he braces himself on his right foot. In order to place himself in the proper position for a long, accurate throw across the diamond, in time to retire the runner at first base. Such plays as this call for speed of foot on the part of the shortstop. Making the throw up where the pivot man can see the ball, along with sure footwork, are very important in the successful completion of double plays. The second baseman comes in to field the ball without a break in stride. He scoops up the ball and with the same motion draws his right arm back to make the throw to shortstop, about letter high. Here's the shortstop with both feet off the ground, receiving throw. He then adjusts himself into position to tag the bag with his right foot, stepping on the bag for the force out at second. This enables him to continue on across the bag and complete the throw and the double play at first base. In this play, the ball is hit to the shortstop's left. With a double play in sight, he feels the ball with his gloved hand fairly close to the bag. Drawing back the hand, he makes a smooth underhand toss at the proper height to the second baseman, who comes across from his position. Tagging the bag, he takes an extra stride in the direction of the pitcher's mound as he makes the pivot and the throw which completes his part of the play. Head coach Art Fletcher of the New York Yankees is responsible for such snappy infield plays as this. Here's Red Rolf hustling third baseman of the Yankees, who was the league's leader in runs scored and total number of safe hits. Red Rolfe has established himself as a major league star. For many seasons, Charlie Garinger has been conceded to be one of the outstanding second basemen of all time. His all-around flawless work on the diamond has had much to do with many a Tiger victory. A recent find of the Philadelphia Athletics is first baseman Richard Sievers. His record at the plate during the last season stamps him as one of the coming stars of the league. George McQuinn, capable guardian of the initial sack for the St. Louis Browns. In addition to being a 300 hitter, he has acclaimed one of the best fielding first basements in the league for his steady, everyday play. Meet Bobby Doerr, second sacker of Tom Yorkey's Boston Red Sox, another good reason why his team finished high in the pennant race. And Mike Tresh, first string catcher of the Chicago White Sox. Mike did a lot of capable catching 
and was the spark plug of the team. He played a very important part in the success of his club. Now, fans, we want you to know and study the pitching form of these outstanding American League stars. Tommy Bridges, right-handed curveball artist of the Detroit Tigers. He's been one of the leading twirlers of the league for several seasons. Another curveball artist and starting pitcher with the Cleveland Indians, Mel Harder. Here's Duncan Rigney of the Chicago White Sox. He had a sensational season his second year in the league. Rigney lets fly with that speedball of his and whoops, he kicked the bucket. The great lefty Grove warming up on the sidelines, getting ready to take the mound as he has done for over a dozen years. Truly one of the greatest southpaw pitchers ever to come into the game. Winning more than 20 games in a season at the age of 20, Bob Feller, ace of the Cleveland Indians pitching staff. Bob burns a fast one right down the main thoroughfare. A sharp breaking curve that has fooled many a batter. Pitching in 61 games without starting one, breaking the previous league record for relief work, Dr. Clint Brown, the medicine man of the White Sox pitching staff. Speaking of control, this marksman believes in his trusty rifle to do the job. Well, that's clever work, Mr. Marksman. But give that ball to Dr. Brown and watch him go to town. Looks like your control is off there, mister. That's better. Take a look. Dr. Brown's still in there pitching. Three out of four. Not a bad average. You're hitting 750. And one more bullseye for the doctor. Down she goes. And that's a pretty good average in any man's league. But it looks like a perfect day for Clint Brown. Control is the answer. The New York Yankees have won many a game with Charles Red Ruffing, a man with exceptional pitching form. During the past four years, he has won 20 or more games each season. In World Series play, he's won five games and lost only one. At the start of the windup, a natural swinging position of the pitching arm is necessary for any type of delivery. With this comes the all-important coordination of mind and muscle. Take notice at this point, the stride has taken place a split second before the pitch. When the hand reaches the back of the head, the weight starts to transfer forward, but the pitching arm and shoulder still remain behind the center of your balance. This gives proper pitching balance and a perfect follow-through. There are two fundamentals you must follow. First, the stride forward takes place. Then the arm and the pitch follow. But wrist action is the most important factor in getting stuff on the ball. Here is where snap and whip of the wrist come into play. At this point, the wrist is just starting to move into the cocked position, just like a spring. From this position, the wrist unwinds as the ball is released. Having a good fastball or a high hard one, as big leaguers have long nicknamed this pitch, is accomplished with free arm movement. The breaking of the wrist at this point can develop a hop on your fastball or add a sharp break to your curve. Young ball players should study and practice some of these fundamentals in order to improve their playing ability. Emil Dutch Leonard of the Washington Nationals. Well, they say that the knuckleball pitch comes under the classification of a freak delivery. But I have worked hard to perfect the knuckleball, and I believe that I have mastered it to a certain extent. Almost every batter has a slight weakness, so I try pitching to spots. This enables me to pitch fewer balls and aid my control. A 20-game winner shows the peculiar knuckleball grip as he delivers the pitch. Watch this knuckleball. It might rightly be termed an airplane pitch, for sometimes it takes off and then goes into a nosedive. Going slowly into the windup, the knuckleball artist Leonard clenches his knuckles firmly against the ball for the proper grip. As it leaves his hand, you can almost count the number of stitches that hold the seams together as the ball does a sort of curtsy on the way to the plate. The catcher is the field general of every ball club. 
And without doubt, catcher Bill Dickey is one of the most valuable players in the major leagues. There have been few, if any, better catchers in the history of baseball. Here's the proper position for the glove and hands when signals are given. Always conceal your signals from the coaches. Holding the glove as a mark for the pitcher is a good suggestion for young players to remember. Receiving the pitch on his left, Dickey shifts with his right foot only when it is necessary to make a throw to the bases. It is essential that the catcher shift into his throwing position the instant before receiving the pitch. The stance behind the plate is important. In taking your position behind the plate, keep the weight forward. At this point, the left foot is advanced somewhat ahead of the right. In throwing, the arm should never drop below the waist and never be raised higher than the head. A straight overhand throw with speed and accuracy should be practiced. The value of properly interpreted signals is of great importance to every ball club. The third base coach forms an essential part in the success of any team. He must make split second decisions that will change the entire result of the score. Here's Billy Webb, third base coach of the White Sox, who will show how he passes signals on to the hitters. In this case, with a count three balls and one strike on the batter, he looks to the coach for the signal. Please, Mr. Coach, can I hit this triple? The coach flashes the hit sign by hiding his left hand, which is the hit signal for the batter. Jackie Hayes, White Sox second baseman, hits one hard, deep to the right of the shortstop, beats it out for a safe hit. Perhaps the greatest offensive play in baseball is the hit and run play. It is generally used when the batter has the pitcher in the hole. With the count two balls and one strike, the batter looks to the coach for the sign. All right, fans. See if you can pick the sign. The coach goes through many movements with his hands to mislead the opposing team. Here it is. Placing his right foot in the far corner of the coach's box is the signal for the batter to put on the hit and run play on the following pitch. The batter receives the signal and Joe Cool pulls his cap with his left hand hitting the plate with the bat at the same time. Signaling the runner at first base. Here's a perfect execution of the hit and run play. The hitter singled into right field, sending the base runner from first to third. The coach is getting ready to give another signal with the feet spread apart. The steal sign is given to the runner at first base, who is off with the pitch, sliding in safely as the ball gets away from the second baseman. Every so often around third base way, the traffic goes through the red lights. Right now, we could use a traffic officer instead of a coach. Get out of here. This bag belongs to me. Well, they finally caught up with you. Well, coach, what do you do in a situation like that? Action, speed with thrills of plenty. There's baseball in victory or defeat. The game that offers the most thrills to the most people. And here comes some fast action on the baseline. The speed merchant and leading base leader of the league is George Cates of Washington. Speed is an essential part of a good ball club. Fast men are able to steal bases and invariably advance an extra base when balls hit to the outfield, which places them in a better scoring position. All young ball players should practice sliding, for this part of the game is the night in itself and most important to a team's success. Getting the proper lead off the base, Case eyes the pitcher carefully. A snap throw from the pitcher forces the runner to dive in head first. He is away in perfect rhythm with a fall away slide. The right leg is bent under. In reaching the bag, the left foot is raised in the air to avoid injury. In rounding the bag, the base runner tags the inside of the sack with his left foot, if possible, to save ground on the way to the next base. The three-foot line is situated halfway down the first baseline, the last 45 feet from home plate. This runner starts down the baseline in the proper way. As the catcher feels the ball and makes the throw to first base, the runner remains inside the diamond. 
after he reaches the three-foot line, interfering with the throw and play at first base. On such a play, the runner would be called out for interference. This runner swings wide at the three-foot line, properly running outside of the playing field. You're right, George. Base running and speed are essential parts of all ball clubs. Hits mean runs, and runs mean victories. There's plenty of power at plate in the American League. Now we present some of the leading hitters of the league who will go through some of the fundamentals necessary to successful batting. And here, fans, is one fellow who packs a tremendous wallop at the plate. Mike Krevich, star center fielder for the White Sox, selects his favorite war club from the bat rack. Here comes one right down his alley. And there it goes on an expedition to Mars as little Mike just gallops over the turf. That drive was well travel stained. Two of the mainstays of the Cleveland Indians, Al Trotsky and Kenny Keltner, who do a pretty good job of hitting on their own. The free swinging Hal puts plenty of power behind every swing, while Keltner punches at the ball, using his wrist and forearm entirely. Bob Johnson, outfielder of the Philadelphia Athletics, for the fifth straight year, has driven in 100 runs or more. Bob finished third in the league batting. He strides forward with the necessary balance, completely relaxed, until he swings hard and fast. The hit at the pitch, the body pivot, and there is a job well done. Watch Rudy York, powerful slugger of the Tigers. Eyeing the pitcher carefully, he strides forward a split second before the start of the swing. This is a necessary fundamental, which enables him to obtain perfect timing when the speed of the pitch is changed. Jimmy Fox of the Boston Red Sox. I follow the pitch until sometimes I actually see the ball hit the bat. Starting your stride slightly ahead of your swing is essential in order to get the proper timing in case the pitcher should change the speed of the ball. That with fast wrist action is about all you need to make a good hitter. With the bat remaining back off the shoulder, Jimmy strides forward. He has a somewhat longer stride than the average big leaguer with a right knee bent hitting against a left leg that is held straight and firm. The left arm is also kept straight when hitting the ball for additional driving power. This gangling youngster of the Boston Red Sox, Ted Williams, was the league leader and runs batted in. As bat hits ball, the right leg is held fairly straight. He spins around like a top to complete the follow through, which leaves him wound up like a corkscrew. But that's where he gets his tremendous power. Charlie Keller takes his position at the plate. A wide stance, bat off the shoulder, held back, waiting for the pitch. This is important, hitting from a comfortable position with the arms and elbows away from the body. A swing parallel with the ground, with a finish of the follow through much the same as these other stars. The forward leg kept braced, bending the rear leg for the required relaxation. It isn't very often that a player the likes of this one comes along. Joe DiMaggio, the league leader in batting and voted the most valuable player in the American League. Joe also uses a wide spread of the feet. A very short stride follows for proper timing of the pitch. Notice all of these batting stars complete the stride before the bat starts forward to meet the ball. Yes, Joe, there's plenty of concentration, snap, and power put into those wrists and arms of yours. There, friends, the slow motion camera has analyzed the style of the six leading hitters of the league. The newest chapter in American League Baseball, playing the game under lights. Night Baseball has proved itself a winner with the fans at Shy Park, Philadelphia, whose athletics were the first American League team to play at night. Cleveland Indians were the next to install night baseball. And here we see the newest installation of a modern lighting plant at Comiskey Park for Chicago White Sox. Eight lighting towers shoot up into the sky, six of them 145 feet high, carrying 768 floodlights. 144 million candle power in night lighting will shine down on the playing field at Comiskey Park. 18 giant transformers are required to supply the current for this huge circle of lights. The opening night game at the Cleveland Stadium. 
home of the Indians, who will have a worthy opponent for the occasion in the Detroit Tigers. This night, baseball is just the thing for fellas like us, because it gives us a chance to get out and see the home team play. We can get behind it now, sure enough. And during the summer run, well, it gives us a chance to see a game now and then. So I'm all for it. President William Harridge of the American League and Alva Bradley, owner of the Indians. Bradley, I want to congratulate you on uh, your efforts in installing the lights in Cleveland. Uh, glad to be here for the first night, and uh, believe you have made a, a great uh, move in the right direction in having nice ball in your city. Well, Mr. Harris, it's something that our public demanded. Personally, I believe that night baseball is something that the major leagues have needed, but it's here to stay, and it's going to be a great asset to all of us. Let's hear what some of the players think about night baseball. Buck Newsom and Tommy Bridges of Detroit. Well, Tommy, I see now the lights have turned on for the first night game here in Cleveland. And it looks like they might have a pretty good plan. Uh, you had pretty good luck at your first night game, didn't you, Tommy? Well, as far as I'm concerned, under the lights, Buck, up to date, they're all right. I happen to get by that first one. Al Trotsky and Kenny Keltner of Cleveland. Well, here we are playing our first night baseball game in Cleveland. Uh, Ken, uh, what do you think about this night baseball? Do you think you like it as well as playing uh, in the daytime? Well, hell, the way they got it now, it uh, looks like we're going to have to play night baseball, and uh, I think the way they have things lighted up now, it's going to be all right. And the ball game is on as the first player grounds out to the infield. The players appear a frisky lot and put on plenty of speed and action for the more than 50,000 fans to witness this game played under the arc lights. Earl Averill, a former teammate, gets the only safe hit of the ball game off the pitching of Bob Feller to spoil the no-hit record of this youthful Cleveland pitcher. Night baseball quickly wins the approval of both fans and players and is well established. Thousands have turned out for these games in Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Chicago. Well, boys, does that answer all of your questions regarding big league baseball? Gee, we sure learned a lot. Now we can play like real big leaguers, huh, fellas? Yeah. 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 How'd you like yeah. it, Willie? <laughs> <laughs> Now we come to the season's climax, the World Series Classic. The stands are one great blur of humanity as the two champions of the year in their respective leagues meet for the title, the Cincinnati Reds and the New York Yankees. Hundreds of newspaper men from all parts of the land are on hand to cover the series for their papers. The rival managers, Joe McCarthy and Bill McKechnie, have a word or two together. Charlie Ruffing and Paul Derringer were the starting pitchers for the first game in New York, where the Yankees victors by a score of two to one. Marty Pearson and Bucky Walters were pitted against one another in the second game. The score ending, Yankees four, Reds nothing. The third game takes us to Cincinnati, where we see the umpires and managers in a huddle at the home plate going over the ground rules. Just before the game starts, Joe McCarthy and coaches are keeping a sharp eye on things as the Cincinnati players leave the bench to take their positions on the diamond for the first inning of play. After Crossetti had walked and Rolfe was retired, Keller walloped Derringer's first pitch for a non-stop flight around the bases as the ball settled behind the screen in the right field bleachers. This put the Yankees out in front by a score of two to nothing. With two men out following Goodman's single, McCoy slammed the first pitch into right field for a safe hit. Goodman taking third on the hit. Lombardi hit the next pitch cleanly into center for a single. Goodman scores run number one for the Reds. Going into the last half of the ninth with one man out, the Yankees leading seven to three, Fry walked. Goodman again single to right, Fry stopping at second. McCormick lined to Keller in right field for the second out of the inning, both runners holding their bases. When Hirschberger hit a high fly to right field, the old ball game was shipwrecked for the Reds. The Yanks made it three straight with a score of seven to three. And then came the fourth and what proved to be the final game of the series. In the sixth inning, with a score nothing to nothing, after Sundra had walked, one man out, Goodman dropped Crossetti's fly close to the line in right field, but recovered it in time to force Sundra at second base. In the first half of the seventh, Keller banged one of Paul Derringer's pitches on a tour to other lands to put the Yanks out in front for the first score of the ball game.
Base hits were popping up like mushrooms as Bill Dickey followed with another 380-foot home run wallop into the center field corner of the right field bleachers for run number two. In the Reds' half of the seventh, after McCormick was safe on Rolfe's error and Lombardi fan, Simmons smashed a liner to the scoreboard in left center for a two-base wallop. McCormick stopped at third. With the Yankees infield playing back, McCormick scored the Reds' first run when Berger bounced to Corsetti and was thrown out at first. At this point, Hirschberger was sent in as a pinch hitter for Derringer, and Joe DiMaggio just missed catching his Texas leaguer, which fell safely for a single, scoring Simmons with a tying run. When Bill Werber followed with a single to right, Myers scored, and the Reds were out in front, three to one. Going into the ninth, trailing by two runs after Keller had singled, DiMaggio smashed a hard drive through short for a base hit, sending Keller to third. At this point, old sister Fate threw in the monkey wrench as Myers dropped Fry's toss of Dickey's bounder near second. All runners were safe. Keller scoring run number three for the Yankees. This was the turning point of the ball game. Selkirk followed with a line drive to Goodman in deep right, DiMaggio tagging up and going over to third after catch. Joe Gordon then hit a hard drive ground ball down the third baseline for a single. Werber made a nice play on the throw to the plate. DiMaggio sliding in safely, however, with a tying run of the game. The first of the tenth. The score tied four apiece. Crossetti had walked. Keller was safe on Meyer's fumble. DiMaggio lined a single to right. Crossetti scored. Keller then headed for home, and as he spun Lombardi around, the ball dropped out of his glove. Wait a minute, here comes that man again. Joe DiMaggio hits terra firma like a comet with a graceful fallaway slide to his left. Clipped the corner of the plate with his right toe for the third run to score on this play. Well, there seems to be some doubt about you tagging the plate there, Joe. Umpire Pinelli was right. Joe's foot is right on the home dish, which puts the Yankees in a 7-4 lead. The last of the tenth with Goodman and McCormick on base as a result of singles. Two men out. Wally Berger lined to Crossetti, and the Yankees were champions of the baseball world for the fourth consecutive year under the able leadership of Joe McCarthy. An all-time major league record. Well, fans, there you have the story of baseball. It's been a full season with new records established by youngsters and by hearty veterans. We'll be back again for a visit with you next year with another vivid behind-the-scenes story of baseball. This production has been made possible through the cooperation of the club owners, managers, and players of the American League of Professional Baseball Clubs and the Kellogg Company of Battle Creek, Michigan, the makers of Kellogg's Corn Flakes. The original has the signature of W.K. Kellogg. Crisp, fresh, delicious. Flavored as only Kellogg knows how. This year, Charlie Keller climbed the ladder of fame in one Zoom. Who will be the stars of future World Series classics? Will it be Ted Williams of Boston, Rudy York of Detroit, Mike Kravich of Chicago, Bob Feller of Cleveland? Fans, you make your choice of the World Series stars of the future.